Hey, what's up, everybody? Gonna do a complimentary quad, man. This complimentary quad is featuring the music of The Grateful Dead and Little Feet. Uh, three tracks uh, from The Grateful Dead and one from Little Feet. Um, so I'm gonna do The Grateful Dead stuff first. Uh, first up is Dancing in the Street, Feel Like a Stranger, Estimated Profit, and then uh, Little Feet's Spanish Moon. So uh, I just, uh, before I pop this off, I just want to give a shout out and a thanks very much to Nick Lawrence. Nick, thanks very much, man. I appreciate the uh, recommendations. I appreciate the links provided. Uh, Nick has also uh, just left me little quick notes here, uh, just an address and then a few little snips uh, following after the actual song. So let me read those first before we uh, get to dancing in the street. So uh, Nick says, Heiser's Disc Golf and Smoke Shop here from YouTube. Um, oh yeah, he said that uh, he PayPal donationed me earlier and realized that Patreon is a much better way to go, so he decided to do that. Uh, he says, I really dig your reactions because you have a good ear for music and you're honest. Anyways, here's a list of some stuff worth checking out. Some live, some studio. So he says about dancing in the street. An old Martha and the Vandalas song recorded by a bunch of classic rock artists. This Grateful Dead version from 5877 has some of Jerry Garcia's most superb improvised guitar soloing of his career. Really starts ramping up about eight minutes in. Yeah, man, this uh, song is like 16 minutes long, so brace yourself. It's going to be a long one. Um, followed by Feel Like a Stranger, and he says it's from their 89 live album without a net. Then Estimated Profit, he says uh, studio version of the Terrapin Station album, Reggae, uh, Reggae Dead, covered by Burning Spear as well. And finally Spanish Moon, he says Little Feet, exc exclamations. Their best song in my opinion, off their extremely polished live album, Waiting for Columbus. And then Nick finally says, uh, thanks for the awesome channel, always looking forward to your reactions, Nick. All right, Nick, thanks very much, man. I'm sure I'm gonna love these. I definitely uh, owe the Grateful Dead, especially uh, their due. Um, everyone knows the story about them being um, uh, tied uh, with uh, Jeff Beck uh, way back in February last year, and uh, it just uh, wasn't the same. So I'll never do that whole tie thing again. And I didn't give uh, either one of the artists their due. So I'm always open to doing more Grateful Dead, even if they end up being Artist of the Month a second time. It's all good. All right, man. Let's pop this off, starting with Dancing in the Street. Grateful Dead version. Sixteen minutes and thirty-five seconds, man. All right. Let's get it. long, funky intro, I can tell.
Eso.
We're gonna take a short break. Slow fade out. All right. Nice. A nice groovy rendition of dancing in the street. An extended jam, extended party. Very nice. It would work well at a party. Excellent. All right. I uh, wasn't even aware that um, they had covered uh, Dancing in the Streets. I know that is definitely a song that is very popular and obviously it's probably been covered by a lot of people. Of course, I'm thinking of Van Halen. Uh, and I remember Bowie and uh, Jagger, they had a, a, a video. <laughs> that was hilarious, that video they made. Uh, of this tune it did quite well too I remember um, it was uh, being played all over the place at one point so yeah quite a lot of notable people have covered this song so no surprise that the Grateful Dead has a rendition a nice funky groovy uh, extended jam rendition very 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 good um, alright man so this is a quad and this track was 16 minutes and 35 minutes long so what I'm going to do here, man, is I'm going to uh, scout down my reading uh, of this tune just so I can kind of make up some time. Because some of the other tracks, too, in length, uh, they're not slouching either. There's um, the following track is seven minutes, uh, almost six minutes, and yeah, almost another six minutes. So decent size or decent length uh, tracks. So I'm going to scout down my reading, especially after uh, Dancing in the Street here and just um, get on to our next track, man. So, let's do a quick read here. Dancing in the street. Hmm. Yeah, so a decent amount of information, but I'm only gonna read kind of like the little intro portion of, uh, of the Wikipedia. So, Dancing in the Street is a song written by Marvin Gaye, William M Mikey Stevenson, and Ivy Joe Hunter. It first became popular in 64 when recorded by Martha and the Vandellas, whose version reached number two on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and peaked at number four in the UK singles chart. It's one of Motown's signature songs and is the group's premier signature song. A 1966 cover by the Mamas and the Papas was a minor hit on the Hot 100, reaching number 73. In 82, the rock group Van Halen took their cover of Dancing in the Street to number 38 on the Hot 100 and number 15 in Canada on the RPM chart. A 1985 duet cover by Bowie and Mick Jagger charted at number one in the UK and reached number seven in the US. The song was also covered by Grateful Dead and Black Oak, Arkansas. All right, and let's stop there, man, because there's a lot more information about dancing in the street, but just specifically about the song itself and all of the different things about it uh, and doesn't deal directly with um, so much the Grateful Dead as just uh, just artists in general. So let's bounce to our second track, man, and that being Feel Like a Stranger. Grateful Dead, Feel Like a Stranger. Let's get it.
Excellent. Very lively and appreciative crowd. They kind of uh, came alive at certain parts, you know. Uh, hey, good jam, man. Good song. Very good song. Feel like a stranger from without a net. Excellent tune. It's one of those tunes that just kind of just takes you, doesn't it? You know, makes you makes your mind wander and you think a little bit and you're visualizing how they look on the stage when they're jamming. I'm visualizing uh, the camera panning out and checking out the crowd. The crowd's dancing. Some are standing there in awe, just gawking and staring. Some are dancing and jamming, you know, that sort of thing. And the dead themselves. I got to check out more of their... Um, live concert footage. I uh, don't have a really good solid visual in my mind as to how they jam together, how they look on stage while they're jamming. I, I've seen bits and pieces, but not enough to really have a solid image in my mind as to say that, yeah, they jam well, they look good, they're in the zone when they're jamming, they're having a good time, that sort of thing. You know what I mean? I, I like seeing a band uh, collectively jamming well, especially when they get into the zone of their jam. So uh, that's what I would like to actually see with the Grateful Dead. And forgive me for mentioning them, whenever I think of the Grateful Dead, uh, I also think of the Almond Brothers. I kind of, I don't know, for some reason compare them as sister bands. And uh, same thing with the Almond Brothers, I think of the Grateful Dead. And I would still also as well like to see some live footage of the Almond Brothers band actually doing some jamming and that sort of thing. Um, I need to see a lot more. I know I've seen one or two bits here and there, but I gotta see a bit more of both bands, you know? All right, man, so let us do a quick read, not go off too much with my talking, get onto some structure here. And uh, yeah, I feel like a stranger has some decent information, so Let's uh, let's do a little read on that, man. Wikipedia. Feel Like a Stranger. Feel Like a Stranger appears on the album Go to Heaven. Go to Heaven is the 11th studio album by Grateful Dead, released on the 28th of April, 1980, on Arista Records. It's the band's first album with keyboardist Brent Midland. Go to Heaven was both the third Grateful Dead studio album in a row and the last for over seven years. It was also the third in a row and the last to use an outside producer in Gary Lyons. The Grateful Dead were contractually obligated to record another studio album before they could release live material. As with the previous two albums, they used an outside producer per an agreement with Clive Davis and in the hope of a more mainstream production with greater commercial potential and perhaps a hit single. Davis sent British producer Gary Lyons, who was known for his success with Foreigner's debut album. With track construction stretching past a couple months, Lyons simultaneously began working with Aerosmith, taking over the production of Night in the Ruts. He commuted between California and New York, trading off with assistant producer Peter Pia. Reception When it was released, Go to Heaven generally received average to negative responses from critics. However, the criticism has softened and Go to Heaven is now regarded as an important album in the band's catalog. The reviews note that a number of the songs developed into strong live numbers. J.M. Dematis, D-E-M-A-T-T-E-I-S, J.M. Dematis Review in Rolling Stone summarized the album as, quote, more of the same uninspired fluff that's become the Grateful Dead's recorded stock in trade. Yo. Though he also acclaimed Brent Midland's contributions. Dematisse, who is better known for his comic book work, came to regret his review of the album, ending his career as a music critic as a consequence. Hmm. Damn. In contrast, Robert Criscow, while complimentary of the rendition of Don't Ease Me In, considered Midland an utter wimp. <laughs> Midland, 
Midland. Uh, that's uh, the uh, yeah, Brent Midland. He was the uh, the new uh, keyboards. Why would he consider him an utter wimp? In 2015, Classic Rock Review wrote, quote, While this may be a far cry from the group's uh, lauded stage improvisation, it made for an enjoyable uh, studio album, which holds up decades later. It still sounds good today, and shows that this band had some vast talent away from the stage, unquote. Okay. Yeah, man, so that is uh, Song Fact Info on this song. Great tune, man. And uh, it's more album information, so the critics were basically just going over so much more the album than the song. But, yo, man, this guy, Chris Gow, and uh, the Rolling Stone guy, uh, they're just not very nice, are they? (laughs) Let's just leave it there. Holy cow. What does it take, man? Okay, so, guess you just gotta be Bruce Springsteen. Alright, let us jump to our third track, man. That being Estimated Profit. Grateful Dead, Estimated Profit. Let's get it. Yeah. 
some uh, references from biblical passages. estimated profit. I get it. It's a very, very good platform they used to tell a story. You got the sexy sex in there. You got the uh, uh, kind of off uh, reggae beat and the harmony, uh, stretching it out into a jam. Excellent. Good storytelling. Uh, yeah, he's saying uh, using some biblical references, uh, and uh, I'm visualizing uh, the rapture. Uh, this is somebody who's very, very confident in the fact that he's going to be um, taken up in the rapture, and he's going to be on the right side of things. <laughs> Excellent, good storytelling. Um, all right, man. So, estimated profit. Good jam. Good jam, man. Uh, Sorry, am I? There we go. Okay. I thought I lost my page for a second. So, Estimated Profit. Estimated Profit appears on the album Terrapin Station. Terrapin Station is the ninth studio album by The Grateful Dead, released July 27th of 77. It was the first Grateful Dead album on Arista Records and the first studio album after the band returned to live tour following a nearly two year hiatus. The album reached number 28 on the Billboard album chart and received gold album status in 87 after being released for the first time on CD by Arista Records following the release of that year's In the Dark. Terrapin Station was remastered and expanded uh, for the Beyond Description 1973-1989 box set in October of 2004. It was voted number 848 in the third edition of Colin Larkin's all-time top 1,000 albums. That was in 2000. Oh man, yeah. That's a lot of info here. Uh, hmm. Let's let's bounce around. I'll just uh, read a little bit uh, on the recording. Uh, with the folding of their own record label and the change in management, Grateful Dead signed with recently founded Arista Records Label head Clive Davis had been interested in working with the band since his time at Columbia Records and had previously signed their colleagues, new writers of the Purple Sage. He added the debt to the label with the arrangement that they work under an outside producer, something they had not tried on a studio album since 1968's Anthem of the Sun, though 1970's American Beauty had been co-produced by engineer Stephen Barnhart. Keith Olsen was chosen to produce and the band temporarily moved to LA as he preferred to work at Sound City where he had recently achieved success producing Fleetwood Mac's 1975 comeback album. Mm. 
yeah, 75. So Fleetwood Mac, that would be, yeah, that would be after the Peter Green years. So we're going into mm, Buckingham Knicks. I think we're just getting into Buckingham Knicks at this point. Olsen had a method for reigning in the dead. Quote, during the cutting of the basic tracks, it was pretty hard to get every member of the band in the studio at the same time. So Steve Parrish went out to the hardware store and got these giant nails and a great big hammer. And as soon as everybody was in, he hammered the door shut from the inside. We didn't have any drifters from the other studios coming in to listen. We didn't have people leaving to go screw around elsewhere. We started getting work done, unquote. Hmm. Man, that's taken some serious measures. With Fleetwood Mac, Olsen had a hands-on approach orchestrating the addition of Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks and influencing uh, song choice, arrangements, and sequencing. He entered the Grateful Dead project with similar expectations, imagining a concept album or song cycle. Olsen said that Davis told him, quote, I need a commercial record out of them, unquote. This caused some friction during the sessions, as well as with the end results. Kreutzmann said, quote, he'd have us play the same thing over and over again, and we were not really the type of band that can put up with that. Our very identity is based on the opposite principle. Unquote. Yeah, I can see that being elements for serious confrontation, man. You know, when you're messing with the... Uh, creative flow, the creative vibe of a band, I guess sometimes for, for better, but most of the time you're going to have a tremendous amount of challenges and turbulence along the way. So uh, yeah, good luck with that. I wouldn't be messing around with that myself. Terrapin Station was first released on CD in 86. In 2004, it was expanded and remastered for the Beyond Description box set. This version was released individually in 2006. Included in the box selections is one track from the May 8, 1977 show at Cornell University. The highly collected concert has been called one of the band's best ever. Initial releases did not list time lengths for the individual sections of Terrapin 1, though the sections were apparent by style and authorship. Various CD releases break the song down into individual track sections, albeit uh, some with nebulous track boundaries. Hmm, okay. And that's the end of the info. That's the info given for um, the album more so uh, than the song. All right, man. Great tune, though. Estimated Profit. Uh, let's uh, check out our final track, man. And that being Spanish Moon by Little Feet. Okay, man. Little feet, Spanish moon. Let's get it.
all in here. Stomping jam. <laughs> good harmony, good musicianship, good breaks. Wow, listen to the crowd, just digging that. Interesting story. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent jam, man. So, man. Yeah, Little Feet. I, uh, I gotta do, uh, definitely more Little Feet. Has it been, uh, it's been, yeah, almost three months since, uh, Paul Barrera's passing. And, uh, I did a did a tribute reaction for Paul um, and I've only done little little samplings of little feet reactions mixed in a couple of complimentary quads but I, 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 I gotta do a little bit more gotta get to know uh, Lowell George and uh, some of the other uh, contributors in the band and um, uh, check out more of their work so uh, yeah Send me a couple of links for uh, maybe a few more quads down the road, man. I'll definitely jump on that. All right, so let's do a little read here, man. And not a lot of info, just a quick short paragraph here. And it's uh, pretty much all album info. Okay, uh, we'll read it anyway. Spanish Moon. Spanish Moon appears on the album Feats Don't Fail Me Now. Feats Don't Fail Me Now is the fourth studio album by American rock band Little Feet released in 74. The cover was designed by Neon Park. According to Richie Hayward, Wait Till the Shit Hits the Fan dates back to their debut, but the band had trouble recording it on the last two albums due to its irregular 7-8 meter uh, length. It was scraped until 
the sessions for this album when it was recorded live in the studios as The Fam, while the original version appeared on Hotcakes and Outcakes, 30 Years of Little Feet. In 2000, it was voted number 718 in Culkin Larkin's all-time top 1,000 albums. And that's all the information given. So, that is it for this excellent pod, man. Interesting lineup there, uh, Nick. You um, you had three uh, Grateful Deads and only one Little Feet. Um, I was uh, I was wondering how come uh, not four Grateful Deads or not maybe two Deads and two Little Feets, but hey. It's your quad, man. So it's all good. Um, Excellent uh, lineup of songs, though. And they were all really, really good, long jam tunes. And so obviously you like the good jamming uh, uh, bands of old. Uh, Well, I shouldn't say old. I'm going to say of the classic era. And uh, yeah, man. uh, These All four of these songs were really, really exceptional. Very, very good. Uh, live performances. I really like that. Excellent tunes, all of them. Man. Uh, like I said, got to get to know a little bit more Little Feet. And I've got to do a lot more uh, Grateful Dead. I know that for, for sure. Um, so let me just scroll down here, man, and uh, see what I got coming up before I bounce. Mm, oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, basically, I've got more quads coming. Um, I, I'm determined not to fall behind as I did a little while back. Uh, but then again, I did something stupid and I, um, erased my reactions calendar. So I won't ever fall that far back unless I do the same thing again. Uh, but I've been backing up, so, uh, that won't happen. So yeah, man, I got more quads coming. Uh, CCR's artist of the month. So I'm going to be, uh, uh, as soon as tomorrow getting on to their fifth studio album reaction and uh, of course I'm going to uh, jump on some more uh, Patreon exclusives and I know that I've got a Pink Floyd coming up uh, it's the 1971 Pompeii I, and I can't recall what song it is but um, now who sent me the link uh, I can't remember who sent me the link either but I'll get on that uh, very, very shortly in the next couple of days, man. So, uh, yeah, in regards to just going back to the dead, I always feel as if um, I really got to do a lot more of the Grateful Dead. And it's a question of should I start from the very, very beginning of the Grateful Dead and work my way up? But uh, first, maybe I should check to see how many albums they've done. Uh, if they're into like something like... 30 albums like the Rolling Stones, then um, maybe I should, uh, I don't know, be selective with it. Like I know a lot of people uh, tell me uh, with the Stones, you can't go from album one all the way up. You got to maybe just stick to their best, most classic eras. And I believe that there's four albums in a certain time slot. Was it 75 to 79? But in any case, um, maybe that's probably how I would probably go about navigating and uh, getting more acquainted with the Grateful Dead, I'm thinking. Anyways, man, I'm going to bounce. I bet you this uh, reaction is going to be over an hour. Uh, Nick, thank you again for your recommendations and the links provided. I hope you like this reaction. And I'll definitely look uh, for an opportunity to do more, not only of the dead, but also... Uh, little feet as well. So everyone take care and I'll see you in my next complimentary quad. Peace.